Assalamu alaikum. Hello everyone. I am Shazman Nahar. I am a proud mother of an autistic daughter who is nine years old and nonverbal. Today, World Autism Awareness Week, day one, 29th of March, 2021. Me, myself, uh, Sani Rahman, I am a content creator and Soj Gurgaon, Dr. Manish Samnani jointly organized this special events today. And we are proudly present today, uh, world legends, we can say, they are the legends in our world. Um, I'm gonna introduce our legends now on the screen. We have with us today, Dr. Temple Gandin. Dr. Temple Gandin, Professor, Colorado State University. She is 100 most influential people. She is the only, uh, one of them. We have Dr. Stephen Mark Shore, a special education professor, Adelphi University, New York. We have Dr. Manish Samlani, occupational therapist, PhD scholar, and uh, founder and director of SOJ. We have with us today Dr. Nusrat Ahmed, Yasmin Ahmed, research fellow at Olga Tennyson Autism Research Center, Let Road University, founder and director at Hope Autism Center. Hi. Welcome to our special live session today. Now, before uh, we move to the main session, I would love to share two video clip of our lessons and um, the one is started with non, uh, dr stephen uh, sorry dr temple grandin cured of autism but what you do is you learn about her as you learn autism but what you do is you learn about her as you learn more and more things well i didn't speak until i was four now I have a BA and a master's and I'm studying for my doctorate. I can remember the frustration of not being able to talk. I couldn't get my words out. My speech came in gradually, a few words at a time. When I was a little kid, I was very autistic, nonverbal, rocking, you know, that's the kind of kid they just put away in the institution. But I had a speech teacher that worked really hard with me, and I can't emphasize enough the importance of the young children getting early intervention. You got a two-year-old or three-year-old with no speech, don't wait. High school was absolutely worst part of my life. Teasing, teasing, teasing. I got kicked out of school for throwing a book at a girl. Teased me because, you know, teasing really made my life miserable. And the only places I could get away from teasing was the specialized activities. Things like horseback riding, electronics lab, model rocket club. The line was drawn in the sand. I was not allowed to become a recluse in my room. I had to get out and do things. I'm always kind of baffled at just how illogical people are in their thinking. I'm very logical in my thinking. But when I was younger, I didn't know that other people thought more in words. You see, I think in pictures. If I don't have a picture, I don't think. And my mind is very, very associative. Being a visual thinker, I have to I tend to put things into categories. You see, autism is a very big spectrum. At one end of the spectrum, you've got half the people at Silicon Valley. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you've got somebody who's very handicapped, remains nonverbal, is, is going to have to live in a supervised living situation. Really, really big spectrum. And, you know, Einstein would probably be labeled autistic today in a lot of school systems because he had no speech until age three. I'm interested in seeing something that makes real change. I've done a lot of work that's made a lot of improvements in the livestock industry, and I think I've helped a lot of kids succeed. I want to see the kids that are like me succeed. That's the kind of stuff that makes me happy. When I see the things that I do make a difference. Dr. Stephen Shaw is a professor at Adelphi University in the United States and an internationally renowned expert in the study of autism. As a child, he was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. After 18 months of typical development, I was struck with what I call the autism bump, where I lost functional communication, had meltdowns, and withdrew from the environment. 
So in short, I became a very autistic little kid. Diagnosis of autism in those days was tantamount to a life sentence in an institution. And the professionals said they had never seen a child who was so sick. My parents provided what we would today refer to as an intensive home-based early intervention program emphasizing music, movement, sensory integration, narration, and imitation. I think the most important thing about my parents is that they accepted me for who I was, but at the same time recognized there were a lot of challenges to overcome if I were to lead a fulfilling and productive life. A lot of progression and development in the understanding of autism since I was a child. When I was first diagnosed, very little was known about autism. Autism was thought to be this rare psychiatric disorder caused by poor parenting and found in about one in 10,000 individuals. Today, the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, in the United States, accepts an incidence rate of one in 50. My best advice for parents of children with autism is to see what your child's interests and strengths are. What your child prefers to do most likely relates to their strengths. It's important for parents of children with autism to realize that their child has unlimited potential, just like every child. And what our goal is, what our responsibility is, is to provide that support so that we can access those strengths of that individual. Now I would like to uh, ask Dr. Temple Grandin to say some few words for all the audience. Dr. Temple Grandin. Well, it's good to be here today. I'm uh, now a professor of animal science at Colorado State University. Been there for many years. And when I was two and a half years old, I had no speech. Just the other day, I talked to a mom that had two-year-old who was nonverbal. And I said that she was lucky to be able to get started on early intervention, early education, really early. I got into a very good intensive program when I was two and a half years old. And one of the first things they did with me was a lot of emphasis on taking turns. You know, little autistic kids, they like to spin things. We'll turn it into a game where we take turns. It's very important for these kids to learn how to wait and take turns. I had a lot of emphasis on that. Now, the thing I observed is that some teachers who work with very young autistic children have the ability to really engage these kids. And there's others that don't. It's almost like some teachers are just born with the ability to kind of to really engage because you have to kind of intrude into the world a little bit. You gotta push a bit. But if you push too much, you can drive them into sensory overload. And sensory oversensitivities are extremely variable. Some kids will be really sensitive to sound. Others, it might be sensitive to certain kinds of uh, lighting that appears to flicker. Um, little autistic kids, I'm talking two to four years old. Uh, if they're not talking, they need two to three hours a day of a teacher working with them one-to-one. -one. Now, there's a lot of people out there uh, charging a lot of money for expensive programs. Uh, that's not, um, you don't necessarily have to do that, but you have to have a teacher that kind of has the ability. And I've got a book called The Way I See It right here. Um, parents, grandparents, volunteers, whatever can work with these little kids. Now, here are some tips. When the grown-ups talked very fast, it went into gibberish. I heard like, blah, 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 blah. But when the grown-ups and the adults slowed down when they talked, then I was able to understand. So slow down when you talk with these kids. You also need to give the child time to respond. The, the processing speed of the brain is slower. I've got to give them time to respond. You know how when you kind of get a web page up on your phone and you only have one bar of service, it takes time to load the web page? Well, this is the way these kids are. You've got to give their brain time to respond really important now if you're in a situation where you have a little kid 
and if you're going waiting six months for diagnosis or you're waiting for this don't wait if you have a young child who's not talking you need to start working with them right now and get a person who has the ability to engage them starting with turn taking then you start teaching them words on um, for their favorite things toys or food slow down my speech teacher she would hold up a cup and she'd go cup and then she'd go cup pa, where she'd alternate back and forth between saying it the regular way and saying it really slowly cup pa, where she enunciated those uh, hard consonant sounds so these are just some tips so you've got a two or three or four year old that's not talking the therapy is pretty much the same whether it's labeled autism or something else you want to work with that kid now and try to get them talking also you need to teach them basic skills things like getting dressed brushing their teeth uh showering you know uh, maybe uh, maybe not the two-year-old so much but with the little older kids um uh, you need to start working with them right now the younger you start working the better Thank you so much, Dr. Temple Grandin. Uh, now I would like to uh, say something, Dr. Stephen Marshall, please, if you say something for our, us. Yeah, certainly. Um, it is a pleasure and honor to be with you today in celebration of Autism Awareness Month. And as I see it, I see autism awareness as building a solid platform in which to accept autistic people, to work with the characteristics, to get into the autistic person's world. And what I mean by that is that at 18 months, I was struck by the regressive autism bomb, like about 30% of us, where I lost functional communication, I had meltdowns, I withdrew from the environment, and I became a very autistic little kid uh, there was so little known about autism in those days that it took my parents a year to find a place for diagnosis. And when they did, the doctor said, this kid is too sick, send him to an institution. Well, fortunately, my parents they advocated on my behalf, like we're seeing increasing numbers of parents do today. They advocated on my behalf and convinced the school to take me in about a year. And that is important for parents to do, to advocate for their children, to get them the supports that they need. So what did my parents do during that year? Well, today we could term it as an intensive home-based early intervention program. There was a lot of movement. There was music. There was sensory integration. There was narration. There was imitation. At first, my parents tried to get me to imitate them. And that's imitation is a time-honored educational strategy. However, perhaps due to a difference in mirror neurons, many aut young autistic children don't imitate. So then my parents flipped it around and they imitated me. And once they did that, I became aware of them in my environment and they were able to move me along. And I believe the key implication is that you have to meet the autistic person where they are. What is interesting to that person? So if, for example, as Temple talks about, if the, if the autistic person is interested in drawing horse heads and that's all they do, that's where you start. However, it is important, as Temple commonly says, to stretch that person. Why don't you draw the entire horse or draw the horse in a stable? And my parents with me, I was making autistic sounds. I was flapping my hands. That is what they did until I recognized them in my environment. And then they were able to move me along. And they got to a point where speech had begun to return at age four. At age four, is when I developed my first, you might say, autistic interest. I was found by my parents taking apart a watch with a sharp knife. I'd pop open the back, I'd take out the motor, I'd remove some of the gears, I'd spin them around, 
and put it all back together again, the watch still worked, and there weren't any pieces left over. My parents, upon noticing this, soon provided all kinds of other devices to take apart, and they'd sit with me and make sure I got them back together again. And that is an important thing for parents to do, to ask the question, what is my autistic child interested in? What is it that grabs them? And that becomes a key in which to establish that relationship. And then from there, you begin to move on. So even at that early age, possibly it could have looked like that I could be a watchmaker or a watch repairman. I would have needed a lot of support. At least at that time, it looked like I would have needed a lot of support in communication and living as an adult, but at least this was something that I could do. So uh, my advice to parents is to observe your child on the spectrum. See what they like to do. How do they spend most of their time? And that leads to keys and to pathways in which to promote further development. Thank you so much, Dr. Stephen Maxwell, for this full advice for us. Now I would like to invite Dr. Manish Samnani to say something about SOCH and our today's live session. Dr. Samnani, please. Thank you so much, uh, Sazmon, and you are indeed doing a wonderful job of uh, uh, making awareness and other so many other activities on your platforms, and you have. Uh, wonderful initiatives and they have they are somehow working for the whole community i have i have been following up i have been participating in all all these programs so uh, welcome dr temple grandin and dr stephen short on this are yet another program that we that I, I i wanted to do with you for a community which is so closely connected to us uh, and we are indeed collaborating with uh, parents organization like such as uh, the Sanya Autism Group. They have a wonderful fan following. They are doing some amazing work and which is of a global nature, not just for UK and Bangladesh, but they are doing amazing work for the whole of, of a global perspective. Uh, autism awareness can only be done by connecting more, by networking more, by bringing the people together. And that's what the intention of this program is today, is to you uh, through, through the platform of Soch, which is a multidisciplinary setting in Gurgaon, India, working since last 14 years in the as, as a as private uh, setup with a lot of programs which are specially curated, designed for the diverse needs of children with autism and other developmental difficulties. So uh, we are very proud to uh, have a very good professional team, which is from multiple uh, domains, occupational therapy, special education, speech, psychology, and physiotherapy for children uh, with uh, developmental difficulties. And uh, I am in, in fact very happy today. And I today is a, a colorful festival of Holi here in India. And may, these, may this colorful festival of Holi bring in, uh, bring in the colorful, and happiness and hope in all the lives of children, parents and families that are connected with us in this program and also otherwise. So uh, we, uh, one more time, welcome all of you and let's uh, we can start and take the program forward. Thank you so much, Dr. Samnani. Uh, and uh, it's your holiday and uh, lots of wishes for you. And it's uh, for Muslim community, it's the Shabe Bharat today, tonight. Uh, so uh, I would like to uh, wish us all the good things for our Muslim community as well. Now I would like to invite Dr. Nusrat Yasmin Ahmed from Bangladesh. Uh, please say something. Thank you so much. Um, I, I must say it is an honor to be here today um, with all the great people. Uh, so I would just share uh, briefly about uh, my experience while working with children and families uh, with uh, special need, especially with autism. So 
yeah, from what um, Dr. Stephen Shore said and Dr. Temple Grandin said and also Manish Tamani said, um, all of them are trying to uh, focus on one thing that and I would just um, uh, reflect on, on what they said before, like here for Bangladeshi parents, we are not here or you are not here to cure autism. Rather, we have to accept autism and try to develop our children's social communication. Um, saying that, uh, what I have seen in Bangladesh, as we all know, the children with autism have two different domains, right? Like one on one hand, they have difficulty in social communication. And on the other hand, they have got some repetitive behaviors, like as Stephen said, like they may flap hands, they may spin the wheel of a car, like something like this. They also have specific interest around uh, things like, you know, it can be thread, it can be car, anything. So... <clears throat> As I said, like we are not here to cure autism, right? So rather than when when we are talking about young children, rather than trying to stop those repetitive behaviors, first, first you try to actually focus on enhancing their social communication. As Dr. Temple Grandin said, as Dr. Stephen Schultz said, that their therapists first started working on their social communication, like turn taking, imitation. Um, those things. Um, what happens actually if you initially, when the child is very young, rather than enhancing his or her social communication, when you try to stop the behaviors that looks odd to you, like flapping hands or rocking, uh, uh, rocking back and forth. So when you try to stop those things, the main thing that they, the trust, the relationship doesn't you know, you can't build the trust and relationship. So if you cannot build that, how would you how would you encourage the child's development? So coming back again, like from Bangladeshi parents' perspective, what I have seen are like they try to focus more on the repetitive behavior side. As soon as they know that their child has autism or might have autism, the first thing they do is trying to stop their repetitive behaviors. So my request, as as other speakers said, like try to enhance their social interaction first and um, accept their them as they are and then gradually develop with the child. Thank you so much, Asma. Thank you so much, Dr. Nusrat Yasmin Ahmed. Uh, now I would like to ask, now we will go to question and answer. And uh, here we have our parents who joined from England. Mehbooba Ferdos. Mehbooba Ferdos has some questions for Dr. Temple Grandin and Dr. Stephen Manchur. Mehbooba, can you hear us? Yeah, yes. I can hear you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Shazmoon. I am so honored to join in this session, and especially Dr. Temple Grandin. I am a huge fan of you. After watching your uh, biography, then I realized, okay, how to deal with my older son. My both of my son are autistic, and my older son started to talk when he was four, and it was so motivated that I was, <laughs> I was crying whole night that I was watching after watching you, your biography and then i started to uh, work with my older son slowly and he is now in mainstream school but the problem is with social and communication difficulties and people can manipulate him easily that's the main uh, problem with him uh, he and he is uh, also uh, is not taking care of his belongings he's uh what is he can't find it his things he can't find it like He's not taking care of things. And like uh, for social cue, he, he thinks that, okay, I'm thinking about the person like that. He will also react me with that, but it is not happening. So always he have the mood swing and upsetting behavior. So what should I do about him? He's 12 year, he nearly 12 years old. Next month he will be 12. And he's in mainstream school year seven. Well, maybe I can comment on... Uh, when I was six, um, everything was kind of a big mess too. But I started to have, you know, some things I liked to do, like drawing. 
And um, I think it's very important to expose kids to a lot of different things so that you can find out what their interest is. If Stephen talked about taking a watch apart, hadn't been exposed to a watch, wouldn't have taken it apart. If I hadn't been exposed to a horse, I wouldn't have been drawing a picture of a horse. And um, uh, art was my thing. And my mother always encouraged my ability in art. And then she encouraged me to draw the entire horse. Now, I was also exposed to musical instruments. Now, that did not work for me. Uh, but for another autistic kid, they could be very talented in music. But you would not know that if you didn't expose them to musical instruments. And there's a, an individual from India, um, T, uh, Tito Makapadehe, who's remained nonverbal. And he, there's a book that he's written called How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move? Strongly recommend that book because his mother took him everywhere, to the market, to the train station, exposed him to lots of different things. Now, he's got more severe autism. Um, he types completely independently, but he uh, can't control his movements. Some of the repetitive behavior he has, he cannot control. Uh, visual system uh, is malfunctioning, even though the eyes are fine, images are breaking up. Um, but there's different people with autism, the fully verbal ones, tend to be good at one thing, bad at something else. And for me, I was good at art. I'm a visual thinker. Um, I think in pictures, and I've talked about that in my book. Um, in my book, um, thinking in pictures, I've talked about how I think in pictures. Now, you might have another autistic child that's good at music, and you might be really good at mathematics, but you don't know. Unless you expose them to musical instruments, you expose them to mathematics. And you might have a little autistic kid that's fully verbal, that's good, good at math. Maybe you need to expose them to computer programming because maybe he could do it. But you don't know if you don't expose them. You know, I think this is a really, really important thing. Um, I'm in the cattle industry and I got asked, well, how did I get into that? Well, I was exposed to it as a teenager and been exposed to the cattle industry. I would not have gotten into it. And then some individuals are a word thinker. They think in words. So some are a visual mind, some are more mathematical, maybe a musical mind, and some are a word thinker. And the thing is, autism is a very, very big spectrum. It ranges from people in that make um, electronic devices, programs like the StreamYard program that we're using somebody had to program it i have been visited the companies that make uh, technology and there's a lot of people on the mild end of the autism spectrum working there as programmers another big problem i'm seeing with a lot of autistic kids uh, is they're, they're getting too overprotected and they go oh well we'll order his food for him i go no you go to a restaurant needs to le learn to order his own food and i'm seeing grandfathers coming up to me Grandfathers that may have been a NASA space scientist on our moon mission, you know, 50 years ago. And uh, he discovers he's autistic when the kids get diagnosed, but he was a fully verbal type, you know, with no speech delay. And that grandfather had jobs when he was young, delivering newspapers. And we need to be finding little jobs. Now I know in your countries, there's lots of little tiny shops around. And these little shops would be very good places for 11 year olds to start learning some work skills, come and help out in the shop, whatever it is, find something that would be safe uh, and start learning some work skills. Uh, because I worked in the construction trades for 25 years, heavy construction, steel and concrete construction. I worked with welders that I know were on the autism spectrum. I worked with machinery designers that when I, that had multiple patents owned a metal fabrication company and they would definitely be diagnosed autistic today you see this is the problem we have a spectrum that goes from the head of a big metal fabrication company or a big uh, computer programming type of company to somebody who can't dress themselves and it all has the same name and then you have some of your nonverbal individuals like tito makapadehe where he can't control his movements but he um he can learn to type independently. So I'd strongly recommend with a nonverbal um, six-year-old, it's time to, or nine-year-old, to introduce uh, typing. 
and one of the easiest things to learn to type on is a tablet with text messaging software on it. Just put it in airplane mode so they can't send anything, but type on the tablet with a text messaging program, pass the tablet back and forth. And the reason why the tablet will work better than the big computer or the laptop is when I look down, my keyboard's way down here. So I push a button, then I have to look up. They cannot make the attention shift. And on the tablet, they can see that print up here next to the keyboard. That's why the tablet works. And I'd recommend a tablet because phones are too small. And and I, I some of these nonverbal individuals can learn to type. You know the autism spectrum. I work with machinery to Okay, I'm done. I don't know if some other interference came in. Thank you so much, Dr. Temple-Vendin. Yeah, I can see that print up here next to the keyboard. That's why the tablet yeah. works. Yeah. I recommend a tablet because phones are too small. And and I, I, some of these nonverbal individuals can learn. You know where the autism spectrum? I work with machinery to I don't know. There's an echo that's going on. I don't yes. know what's happening. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, Mehbuba, you can ask uh, your second questions, please. Yeah, my eight-year-old uh, is non-verbal autistic. Uh, he listened to different type of language, same cartoon in different languages, and sometimes he speaks like words, like water, star, in Bengali, in French, in uh, Spanish. Sometimes he says word, but in different languages. And when we want to, uh, we want to imitate uh, our words. He doesn't want to. He just press our mouth. He doesn't want to, and he just giggle. And when we copy him, then he giggles. But he doesn't want to talk. But he can. After two months, three months, suddenly he will say a word. Well, and a question often comes up about whether the, you should you you know whether the you should use just one language or maybe more than one language. A lot of these kids can learn what well, school we talked at one English maybe and at home we talk your 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 language. Um uh if he's um, got a language that he seems to be good at, I'd probably encourage the one he's good at. Um but the old way of thinking was only use one language. Now the new way of thinking, these these children can learn multiple languages and if the family is in a situation where you need to use more than one language just go ahead and use it and then they may learn at home i speak this at school i speak this they can learn that like he he can understand both english and Bengali. he can follow the instructions no problem with that but he doesn't want to talk how well can maybe I... he'll maybe he'll type give him the text messaging a program on a tablet and see if he'll type right. and just uh I, uh, because uh, some of some of these individuals can learn to type really, really easily, and another advantage of the tablet is it's easy to pass back and forth. I went to a um, um, a disability conference at one of our major big corporations, and I went to dinner with a man that was deaf, and I don't know sign language. We passed my phone back and forth. And that's how we talk. Now he could type on the phone, um, and we just passed my phone back and forth, and we didn't send the messages. We just passed the phone back and forth, and we were laughing and having all kinds of fun. And it was easy. Also, tablets are something that's readily available. There's lots of old electronics around too that you can find. Uh, electronic yeah. electronics is easy to find. Yeah, he is using iPad. Use using, but he can use any kind of electronics. I bet. Well, let's encourage typing. Let's learn how to type. Now, the phone. I'd rather start with the tablet. Phones are very little, and some of these kids have trouble controlling movement. The tablet has a bigger keyboard. I would try that, and he might just start typing. I'm, I'm not sure which language he might choose, but I would use the language that works the best for him. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Uh, I, like to, I like to figure out things that are simple that I know what people can do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Temple Gandhin. Uh, Mahabuba, I think you are satisfied uh, with the answer. Um, 
Thank you very much. <laughs> Now we move on to Dr. Stephen Marshall. Uh, sir, I have a question. Uh, for, I have a question for Dr. Uh, Stephen Marshall. That is, um, is like it's basically uh, about Bangladesh, Bangladesh perspectives. I'm asking the questions. What will be your suggestion for our high functioning ones who are hiding in the society and is struggling in personal relationships? They don't want to get diagnosed because of stigma. So what? Can you hear yes. me? Yes, I, yes, I, I certainly can. And um, uh, for people who are uh, more able to talk and interact like Temple and I, uh, I think it's important to show these individuals that, uh, that autistic people can be successful in the workplace and in the community. Uh, part of what goes into, uh, part of what makes so much stigma for autistic individuals is that uh, there's a lot of, there's still a lot of shame in having differences and having, di and having disabilities. Uh, as we, as this month is Autism Awareness Month, I think we need to uh, move the conversation from awareness to acceptance. Acceptance of the characteristics of autism as uh, uh, Dr. Nusrat Ahmad was talking about. Acceptance, working with the characteristics. So for example, if you have a child in school who is not interested in doing math, for example, but they have an interest in using a flight simulator on a computer, uh, immediately we realize that this is an activity he likes to do, and this activity can be used to motivate the child to learn math. However, a good way to go about this is not to take away this favorite activity, but to use this activity. There's plenty of mathematics involved in flying airplanes, whether it's trying to figure out how fast they're flying or how far they can go or how long it takes for them to go somewhere. And that's an example of working with the characteristics of autism, accepting those characteristics. And also pointing out uh, various role models, people who are on the autism spectrum. Many people think that Albert Einstein was autistic. Many people think that Bill Gates is autistic. And Bill Gates seemed to do very well with his computer business. So in other words, focusing on the strengths, focusing on the abilities, and asking the question, what can the autistic person do? I want to make a comment on shared interests. OK, how do you get social? I, had, I was bullied and teased as a teenager. And the place where I had friends was shared interests. And for me, it was horses, electronics, and model rocket club. Another child, it might be a Star Wars movies. Um, one teacher started a Star Wars club and that got um, friends for this autistic kid. Friends through shared interests. It could be a chess club, a math club. Um, it could be cooking. It could be woodworking. It could be many, many different things. It could be playing in the band. I know of several um, kids with autism in high school, they went in the school band in music, and that was a shared interest. Friends through shared interests. I think that's really, really important. And Temple is absolutely right. And my parents, seeing that I was interested in bicycles, they got me involved in a bicycle club, and I made many friends outside of school in that bicycle club. Uh, music, uh, also an interest of mine, as uh, Temple suggested, making friends in the band. For me, uh, middle and high school was actually better than elementary school because middle and high school is where you start seeing courses, clubs, and activities based on particular interests. And I joined that band. And now I had that structured activity in which to mediate my interactions with others. And it's these interests in these groups that can lead to areas of vocation 
or employment or avocation. And I spent many years studying music. And for a while, I was a music professor before I started getting more interested in special education and autism and changed to becoming a professor of special education. I want to make a comment about this uh, uh, question that's appeared here on the bottom of the screen about an eight-year-old jumping with severe behavior issues. First of all, that behavior issues is too general. I do not know what the problem is. So let's discuss some of the things that might be causing a behavior issue. And the first thing you have to look at is sensory. Does this problem happen in a noisy environment? a crowded shopping place, a train station, lots of people around. And that may be sensory. And sensory problems are extremely variable. One child may have sound sensitivity, another kid touch sensitivity. Now, sometimes um, a sensory problem can be reduced by letting the child control the sound. So if it's a noisy thing like a hairdryer or a vacuum cleaner, you let the child turn it on, let the child control it. And when they control that noisy thing, they may get to be able to tolerate it. Um, so behavior issues can have a sensory basis. Um, they can also happen because the child has no way to communicate, completely frustrated, no way to communicate. So maybe a simple way to give them something to communicate is a piece of cardboard with some pictures on it of uh, foods, water. Maybe he wants uh, a hat, you know, some toy where he can point to some things that he wants to give him a very simple way to communicate. So it could be sensory that makes behavior bad. It could be frustration because they can't communicate. Uh, sometimes children learn to manipulate where they, they have bad behavior to get out of doing something or to get attention. And then there are a few individuals where it's a psychomotor epilepsy, where they might be in a calm environment, all of a sudden they start screaming and you treat that with an epilepsy drug, but that's relatively rare. It's more often that a lot of behavior problems are brought on by sensory oversensitivity. See, this is where you have to track it down and figure out what is causing the behavior. I also need to know what the behavior is. You see, as a visual thinker, then I can start visualizing. Well, this child is similar to uh, you know one that I talked to at this conference. I have to put them in categories. But there's a tendency to overgeneralize, and it's impossible to answer this question uh, when it's overgeneralized. Also, again, my book has got um, a lot of good tips in it. The way I see it the autistic brain book and these are both available in electronic books too um, the, uh, on sensory issues because the first thing i want to look at with these behavior issues is are they brought on by certain sensory situations you can also get problems with lighting okay we're getting a lot of led lights now and some of these led lights the child can see them flicker now some individuals have this problem others don't this is where sensory issues are so variable. But you'd have a behavior problem, too, if your lights in your house were flashing like a strobe light. And we have all these new electronic lights now. And some have the flicker problem and some don't. So you need to figure out, is it a certain light that causes the problem? Then you'd have to get some, if you can buy the old-fashioned bulbs that waste energy, those do not flicker. They're getting, in the U.S., they're getting very difficult to buy now. But these lighting issues can be really bad for some people, not everybody, just some people. Uh, Temple is absolutely right. And you have to be a bit of a detective. And in order to be a good detective, you have to look for some very specific things. So what is happening before a challenging behavior occurs? And if you could determine what that trigger is, yeah, often referred to as an antecedent. What is the trigger of that behavior? Then uh, that will take you a long way into finding some specific answers. I want to make a comment on another question that just came up on the on the on the chat. 
across the bottom of the screen. Um, I'm seeing some really bad problems with uh, kids on the autism spectrum getting addicted to video games where they're doing nothing else. And, and we've got to get that under control. Now, I also noticed on that, um, you know, caption that came across the bottom that the child knew how to do coding. Well, I'd encourage the computer coding. Let's teach them JavaScript. That's what makes Minecraft work. Let's learn, because that can turn into a job skill. Take that and expand the coding. That I'd encourage. But the thing I'm seeing is I'm having parents come to me and you know, their child is now 22. And all he does is play video games all day. Or using that aircraft simulator all day is, either, is also not acceptable. Um, now, some of these individuals <coughs> that have been really bad video game addicts, are often uh, visual thinkers like me. I don't have any of that stuff in my house. I just saw the new Microsoft aircraft simulator. Uh, I would love it. I'd be afraid to get that. I'd be playing it all day. That's all I'd be doing because I'd want to do every kind of aircraft. I has real air traffic control. I'm kind of an aviation geek. Uh, it's probably better for me not to have that because it would be just be uh, too addictive. But some of these kids that are addicted to video games can get can get weaned off into mechanics. There's been three cases where very, very severe video game addicts went into car mechanics, or they could go into airplane mechanics. And they just, these were adults, young adults, fully verbal, eight hours a day, 10 hours a day of video games, all they did. And they started teaching them how to fix cars. And one of them now is fixing trains for the railroad, and they love him because he's so good at fixing trains. And, and uh, you have to replace that video game playing with something else. But I'm seeing some really bad outcomes with this. It's like go into the bedroom and play video games all day or get out and have a life. And this is the other reason why I'm pushing for teaching work skills early. In both of your countries, you have lots of little shops. And I have been uh, and I've seen those little shops and I think mm, that one right there perfect place to put a 10 year old to start helping out and learning some work skills. Temple is absolutely right. And when it comes to work and uh, it's important to start that work early and that begins with chores around the house and taking responsibility, maybe for making the bed or taking out the trash or feeding a pet, uh, whatever needs to be done around the house because chores uh, very similar to work. You have to do them on a regular basis, day in and day out, whether you like it or not, and you have to achieve a certain proficiency. And then as Temple said, by the time you get to age 10 or so, finding a job outside of the house, something that can be done in a little shop. And during my time, when I had come to Bangladesh, Often I'd notice these little bicycle shops that uh, people would set up on the side of the road. And I'd think, well, if I was a little kid, if I was eight or 10 years old, I would have loved nothing more than to, uh, than to help, some, help one of those workers out fixing bicycles. And so I'm seeing a lot of good comments and a lot of good questions in the comment area. I'm seeing some people I know, such as Selena Saltana, great to see you. I see Veronica Ortiz, great to see you too. And other familiar names and new names as well. Uh, I did see a question about uh, somebody asking about a child who doesn't talk or won't talk. And I think one of the most important things that we can give to our children on the spectrum is a reliable means of communication whatever that is. And as Temple mentioned earlier, uh, it, it, could be, it, it could be an, an iPad or a tablet device, which is very good because the, where you type the keyboard and you see the results on the screen are very close together and the autistic person doesn't have to at switch attention from the keyboard, which is down there, to the screen, which is up here, because it's all in one place. <laughs> It's vitally important to develop that reliable means of communication first, however that's going to be done. Now, there is a myth 
that if we teach an autistic person an alternative means of communication, be it an iPad or a communication board, sign language, whatever it is, that the person will be lazy and just not bother to speak. Now, in contrast, there is research suggesting that if we teach a child the meaning of language and how it works, that if speech is going to occur, it's going to occur even faster. And if that speech and talking is just never going to occur, at least we've provided that person a reliable means of communication. Now, I see somebody asked about the importance of the use of a visual schedule for vi individuals uh, with autism. And yes, they're very important. Uh, many of us, I think most of us are visually based, autistic or otherwise. And uh, those visual schedules are very helpful. However, as Temple said, there are plenty of us who have different orientations, such as being focused on words or in, pat or, or in patterns. And we need to be aware of that as well. Yeah, I want to comment on this other question that I saw on the screen about the nine-year-old shoving and pushing the six-year-old. Um, that's a behavior that would have been some consequences for doing that. Um, when I was nine years old, uh, my mother and the school worked really closely together. And if I had a screaming uh, episode, uh, there was no television for one night. And that rule was the same in both places. And... Uh, <clears throat> shoving and pushing you make it a rule you know you push the six-year-old or you hit the six-year-old and there's no video game for one day there's a consequence for doing that now you can sometimes get a behavior where it's constant where they're just doing something constant and it's something you've got to stop then you would start rewarding going an increasingly long period of time of not doing the behavior but shoving and hurting the uh, six-year-old, that's something that has to be stopped. Okay, we talked earlier about repetitive behavior. Some situations there, you don't stop that, but this is dangerous behavior. And uh, I would have lost television for one night for doing something like that. Um, sometimes laughing for no reason. I sometimes laugh for no reason when I just see something that I think is really funny. I might, we might be in the car and I'd see a sign that I thought was funny. So I'd laugh about it. Thank but you. So much. Behavior, we do have to stop it. And that's dangerous behavior. The, yes. the pushing and hitting a six year old. Yes. Um, we have only 10, eight minutes to go and we have to finish the live session. So we're not going to take any more questions. Uh, now I would like to say some th some few words to, to Dr. Monish Damnani uh, about uh, what actually we want. We are now 2021, 29th of March, day one, what is on awareness day. So what will be your message for the, uh, parents and for specialist children? Dr. Monish Damnani. Thank you so much, uh, <clears throat> Sazman. And... Uh, uh, I am more representing the perspective of the parents here in the Indian community in neighboring countries and whom we are in, in touch with. Uh, and it is great to have this opportunity where this part of the world can actually connect to the world where Dr. Temple, Dr. Stephen are, because that's how we can bring together, connect together, find something that can help each other. Uh, in the from the from the parents community here in India, in Bangladesh, in uh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, where we where I, Dr. Temple, Dr. Stephen have done separate FB Live programs, we have always. Uh, I think the parents are still looking for a lot of solutions. So, like Dr. Stephen said, beyond the awareness, there's a lot of acceptance required. And I think the parents in this community are still struggling, still looking for solutions. They may or may have, may have understood the condition. They have understood the areas of difficulties, but they are, they are still uh, looking for interventions. 
they're looking for access to these interventions they're looking for information and knowledge on the on the right kind of interventions that 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 they should be availing that they should be looking forward to there's too much of information also sometimes that creates a problem because there are there are a lot of information that are not evidence based that are not proven and but they still are, uh, are, are running around the people and it is difficult for a parent to himself decide what does my child exactly need what is it that he, he should be actively doing an effort towards out of these myriad informations or interventions what is the best solution best practice that they can follow i think that's still a big question here in this in this in in our community the second uh, thing that i would like to say on this occasion and also you know representing the parents is uh, we say you know we need to empower the mother we need to do uh, awareness program for the mothers we need to include the mother in the intervention and therapy i think the mom has already has so many things to do i think the mom's plate is already full there is a need to focus on the family based intervention and not just mom based intervention i think that's important because it's a perspective that is still to be received here in this community still to be kind of understood how the family would be the center of intervention rather than the only the child and the and the mother and the, and the and the third thing of course uh, in 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 this kind in this uh, population uh, is is still about in with this pandemic situation with this coming up of uh, uh, difficulties in really being together in one place we are still struggling with those children who were into a inclusive setup how would they continue to gain the benefits of inclusion the benefits of just having a social emotional growth we are not really you know very concerned about the academic aspect but the social emotional which is true for any other regular child as well i'm sure but the schools being still being shut beyond one year it is still to uh, still to be answered of or find out some solutions to how technology can help in inclusion with that i would i would like to close my uh, somebody asked um, how people could contact me i do have a website templegrandon.com templegrandon.com it has lots of information on it too and uh, any information that's on templegrandon.com i give you permission to translate and use Thank you so much, Dr. Champion. Thank you so much, Dr. Samnani, for your very, very like useful message for us. Now uh, I would like to say something, Dr. Nusrat ah Ahmed. Uh, please, would you, could you please say something like your message? What could be your message for us? Yeah. So as Dr. Sharma Manish said, like these connections were like between our world and the western world is really very important and we look forward to have more of this type of discussions the thing is the reason is we don't know what to do in our countries like we have especially in bangladesh we the language barrier is so much like we don't know like many of us even the professionals they don't have the knowledge in english so we don't actually we don't understand even if you give us an article we don't understand we can't take the meaning of so what we are trying to do mostly is kind of work towards children's development but but we don't have a clear cut way around so on one hand we need to know what will work for our children so these type of discussions actually give us a, as a direction, which a path that we can follow. But more importantly, for the professionals of Bangladesh, not for the parents so much, but the, for the professionals of Bangladesh, uh, I don't know about India, but I would like to know more, more importantly, what is not working for us. You know, if we don't know what is not working for us, how will we actually uh, tailor the interventions that are used in the Western countries? So, so because we are, um, we uh, like when everyone claims that they are getting a good result, that creates a question: What's wrong? What there is something wrong? So we need to find out. Actually, we need to have a clear direction, and these type of. Um, 
discussions will help uh, to give us uh, uh, some of the help us in that way um, so on the other hand parents parents are being frustrated they get frustrated like probably they are not getting so much help from us professionals so get they get frustrated which is quite okay but what um, uh, what i would suggest what i would request the parents that please do not try to become a therapist no matter what you keep contact with the service programs you try to build on your child's strength and interest you try to work with the uh, service program you voice for your child but you as a parent try to be the parent because after everything after all these things the child needs normal parent child in a relationship if you um, do anything that will uh compensate uh, the normal parent child interaction that would be that won't be good so actually what um, i'm trying to say is the relationship between the parents and professional has to be very trustworthy clear and transparent thank you so I much make, i want to make a comment i we have some areas in the united states where there's no services and uh, I always tell mothers, you cannot do all the therapy yourself because you're going to get so stressed out, you cannot function. But we have some very good religious organizations, and uh, I suggest that they get some grandmother volunteers. We don't have any services in parts of the U.S. You know, read books like this and some other books, because the worst thing you can do with a three-year-old that's not talking is nothing. That's the worst thing you can do. And the thing I have seen with teachers or therapists, whatever you want to call them, some teachers and therapists have the ability. It's almost like a natural ability to get through to these kids. And then you see progress. Okay, what's progress? More speech, more interaction, turn taking, learning to dress, brush your teeth, you know, your you know, basic skills, uh, because the therapy is not available. So I, I, so we can, but get grandmother volunteers because a lot of older grandparents just sometimes have the ability to work, work with these little kids because these little kids that are nonverbal need a lot of one-to-one -one interaction with an effective teacher. That's what I'm going to call that person. Uh, and you've got to get help, and you're just going to have to get it in the community. In my country, in the areas where there's no services, it's the religious organizations, the churches. And that's the support group that they have available. And uh, maybe for you, it'll be the mosque. You get some grandmothers from there because you, the, the science is very clear on this. The worst thing you can do with a three-year-old that's not talking is nothing to just let them sit in the corner and, and play with electronics or TV all day. And Temple is absolutely right on that. And the most important thing, there's many different approaches out there, some expensive approaches, fancy methods. And we hear about a lot of things from other countries such as the United States. And they're all well and good. However, what is most important is that intensive one-on-one -on -one interaction with someone who understands how to interact with that autistic person. And as Temple mentioned, it isn't necessarily someone who's done a lot of reading and has a PhD in a particular subject, but it's someone who can connect on a personal level. You've got to have just, that interaction. They just know how to connect. And and grandmothers have had, you know, a lot of interaction with lots of children in a lot of cases. And sometimes it's a grandmother who could be a volunteer that could come into the house. I tell them the moms are stressed out. I just talked to a mom of a two-year-old, newly diagnosed uh, just two days ago. She's completely stressed out. I said, you've got to get some help. This is another low-income situation. And I said, you need to get some, you know, go to your church, your religious organization. And... Uh, enlist a grandmother to help. And the thing you will find, let's say you have two grandmother volunteers, one will have the ability to get progress in that child and the other one will not. It is just some people have the ability to work with these kids and you need to find them and you need to do it now, do not wait. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Temple Gandhi, Dr. Stephen Marshall, Dr. Manish Samnani, and Dr. Nusrat Yasmin Ahmed. Thank you so much. Hopefully, we will have you in future more because you can see we need you. We parents, we need you all. Uh, hopefully, you will come our show again and again. And thank you so much for today. And Dr. Shamnani, if you want to say some last, uh, we are finishing. So on behalf of Soj and Sanya Rahman, hopefully we will do more in future like session like this. What, what will be your say, sir? I think to conclude, I, I must say that this program has, has completely lived up to the expectations, the objectives that this program had. And that was about making the making autism community come together. We have people uh, from UK, we have people from India, Bangladesh, and from any many other countries. And all thanks to Dr. Temple and Dr. Stephen for being so available, for being so reachable, that it is it is beyond any uh, beyond any words about how can we express our gratitude to to people like you who would have, who would have uh, have taken out this time for for such a program not just once i have yeah. had these programs multiple times now with uh, with the help and facilitation of dr stephen uh, and connected with uh, dr temple we also did a pediatric conference in india where both of them were uh, were a part of the presentations and it's it's so amazing to have have you uh, so so much easily in our reach so uh, thank you once again and uh, I, I hope we will continue to do these programs. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, the viewers who uh, are joining with us today. And thanks for your question. Unfortunately, we couldn't able to take all the questions, but uh, inshallah in future, we will try to uh, get all the questions and answered. Thank you so much, Dr. Trample Gandhi, Dr. Stephen Markshore, Dr. Monish Samnani, Dr. Nusrat Yasmin Ahmed for giving us such a lovely, wonderful evening. Thank you so much and have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.